doing my startup show. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it was an unusual situation to even have knowledge of this. I'm glad that you invited me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity for this interview in the middle of Miami. It, it's a wonderful place to be. Um, so as far as I know that you live here in uh, Miami Beach and you are semi-retired. That's correct, yeah. And your passion is uh, entrepreneurship businesses and you have a very long experience about developing businesses, different kinds of businesses. Yes, and the opportunity here in the United States is a great opportunity for anyone a good idea to be able to take it to a level outside of just the workplace and start their own company and their own business. So tell me, uh, how did you start to get into entrepreneurship? It started um, working for people and then forming our own company. It happened to be back in the copy machine era. And this is going back to the days when Xerox only made copy machines, and there was another company by the name of Apico, American Photocopy Equipment Marketing, that was also out. They were the originators of the first photocopier, but it was not done on regular paper. Uh, I got an opportunity to go to work for them. My background was electronics. I worked in the military prior to that. When I worked for them, I had to go through a multitude of interviews, and eventually I got hired. I went through a training course. I actually had to pay an agent $420 to get the job. That paid me a grand total of $50 a week. That was how many years ago? Forever. So it's going back, um, it's probably going back to, it was prior to 1971, maybe a few years prior to that. And the opportunity was there if I was able to make sales. I did very well in sales. I got promoted into management and then had to train other people for sales. And then I developed territories. And ultimately, I became the regional manager of a Fortune 500 company for the entire state of New York. In doing this, I still had a very limited income, working extremely hard and cultivating people in the field in order to generate income for the company. And the person that I replaced as the regional manager got in touch with me and was forming a new corporation with regional managers from Smith Corona, Olivetti, and a variety of other companies. There were about four or five different companies at the time. We joined forces and started a company called Copy Data Systems. And after approximately a year and a half, now I had my first business, but it was really started by somebody else, and I was brought aboard as an owner. The company eventually went public, meaning that it became a stock company. After how many years? Uh, about two years. Okay. We opened up offices in various locations, and I noticed that there was a great deal of multiple factor, as opposed to one-on-one -on -one factor, on income, meaning that the stock was worth multiples rather than the actual true value of the, of the company itself based on the interest of the people buying the stock. When that happened, it was something that I learned in the field. An opportunity came my way after a few years. So let me stop you here because it's a very interesting point that you raised. What is the reason you believe that the stock was undervalued? Was it a bad um, marketing pitch behind? No, no, no. I, I, I honestly, maybe I miscommunicated. The stock was a very good thing. It was the first time that I realized, not knowing anything about the stock market or having studied business, that I realized the company could be worth a lot more than just its assets and its receivables. And that is how the stock market got into a recognition point within me. And at that time, and I enjoyed it, I loved it. The challenges were always there. I wasn't even looking at management until that same gentleman, Ken Kramer, came my way. And he indicated to me that we really were good enough to be able to have our own company. 
And in those days, you didn't have the computers to put these things together. And it was my first opportunity to put together a business plan to see how we would be able to do things. And yeah. There were no spreadsheet programs. So when you were doing your computations and projections, and you were changing any one thing that affected everything else, you would have to white it out, retype it, resubmit it again. It turned out it was a great learning experience, but it never became necessary. Uh, in a short period of time after joining the firm, in a short period of time being about two and a half years, and doing pretty well there, Ken got in touch with me and indicated it's an opportunity for us to be or have our own company due to a, a publicly traded company that was strictly doing bonds for institutions the banks and insurance companies, etc., hedge funds, etc., and um, they were looking for somebody to start up their retail division. They were a 54-year-old company, very well established, and they were looking to bring Ken and myself in, and in turn we brought a number of other people in and started their division, what we would refer to as retail. And we did projections on these things. We were now had an opportunity to receive stock in the company. What does the product mean? Municipal bonds. Now, municipal bonds are generally sold in denominations. It could be as little as $5,000. It rarely is going to be less than $25,000. And they go up from there. To give you an idea, <clears throat> the shock that set in when I first entered that business was in my third month of business, I closed an account, which I still remember, and it's still going well today, BEA Associates. I actually wrote, without having full knowledge of how I was doing it, I actually wrote a million dollar order. The first order in only three months, I was still learning the business, and it became a strong account. It wound up that after doing the million dollar account, I quite frankly was asked by everybody, did you ever think that you'd be able to do that? And I indicated that I didn't think it was anything special. It was. I guess you, you could say that to be an entrepreneur or successful in life, you have to have the visualization in order to move forward and make it a reality. It shouldn't be a dream, it should be your reality that you bring into focus. So you just m mentioned the word visualization? The word? Visualization. Visualization, yes. Visualization is actually seeing yourself in the position, recognizing it, knowing full well that you may not know what you have to do and at the same time still realize that you're going to be successful at it. And uh, let me ask you now about uh, your recent experiences about startups working with the different companies. Okay, uh, startups, things have changed based on regulations. Uh, most people either have an idea of one kind or another and they look to see if they can develop it from that point forward. If it is a really innovative idea, they need to protect whatever that idea happens to be, if it's unique in the industry, by applying for patents if necessary, or proprietary rights to it. They also should have an attorney and prepare some documentation, which are non-compete documentation, uh, that their lawyers can draw off for them as well. I would not recommend a novice do this on their own. Every penny that they spend for protection would be well worth it. After having all of these things, then they need to develop a prototype. On that prototype, they can submit that this has been accomplished. They should always document it and keep a paper trail. Once that paper trail is established, they can take it to the next step. And in many cases, it requires funding, and it also requires marketing and advisories in regard to uh, market share. Whether it has to be a, a uh, customer service item or whether it happens to be an actual tangible item, doesn't matter. One thing needs to be figured into this business plan, and if it, if it hasn't been done, it needs to be done is the cost of acquisition of the customer or the product. And this can be done in various stages as the product expands from one level to another. You usually do a trial. 
if the trial is successful, you have a step up from there, which would be outlined in the business plan. When you get to a certain point, you can see that the funding may jump substantially from an out-of-pocket situation and just general uh, capital to seeking additional capital. That can be done by doing a private placement memorandum and filing it accordingly based on the amount of money needed. This can usually take you up to about $10 million. Mm -hmm. On the basis of that private placement, you may be giving away some shares of your company based on the money that is coming in. Usually you're looking to give away at the most 15 to 30 percent, and that's pretty substantial when you come down to the origination of the stock itself. However, you can also water down that stock if it's so labeled at a future date. So the originating stock is at one level. When you've reached the point on your private place memorandum, which was your minimum point as outlined in the prospectus, you then can go forward with your project. At that point, you can take this into another trial situation. The next step is generally going to be to get investment advisors or investment bankers or perhaps stock companies behind you. And again, I ask you to really keep the documentation and legal situation uh, beyond just your scope of intelligence and making sure that you have the right person handling it. So we're now at a point where let's say that you have raised close to $10 million and you're looking to now take this company public, meaning that stocks are going to be issued where the public can actually participate in buying shares into your company. The reason for doing this is your valuation initially is based strictly on your cash in the bank, your receivables, and your, and your basic tangible assets of one kind or another, whether it be inventory or otherwise. That's your true worth. However, when you go into a public realm, you have a multiple that's what might have been one share of stock worth perhaps $10,000, now perhaps you have 10,000 10, shares of stock worth $100,000. That's a 10 multiple. In order to do that, you're now giving away another portion of the company to the public, and that has to be filed and accepted by the Securities Exchange Commission. In doing this, that filing is then announced. The people that are the founders of the company have their allocations as far as the stock goes and the origination, as well as the original investors. Everything is outlined again in the prospectus. There's usually a kickoff date, and it's called the IPO, the Initial Public Offering Date is established. There's usually dog and pony shows going on, there's press releases and all types of circumstances coming forward announcing what the stock is going to be, not the price. Mm -hmm. The market people are the ones that are going to establish the price per share and that is an important factor as outlined by many of the companies that have gone public over the past year or two. If the stock is sold out quickly and the price goes up quickly, that means that the price was undervalued and the, and the facts are that you could have gotten more money for the company by pricing it higher. At the same time, if the stock is sitting there and it goes down, that means just the opposite, obviously. Once the stock is public, and I'll explain that to you as well, it then becomes free trading for certain parties and leaded stock, or what we call restricted stock, for others. If I was a principal in the company, or if I was one of the workers in the company, working off of what I refer to as sweat equity, meaning that I got shares in the company, that means that I may not be able to sell that stock, and it has certain restrictions. Maybe I'll be able to sell 10% of the stock holdings that I have in the open market, and I can do that perhaps at six months or it could be one year. Usually restricted stock is working on a balance of two years on a maximum basis. 
but it will be outlined again in the prospectus. And at this point, then you know when the market has the opportunity of being flooded with more shares of stock and possibly diminishing the value of the stock. The, the aspects and decisions that are made by any company to start off with, is it more beneficial to really go through the rudiments of becoming a public company step by step and doing these filings over and over again and answering questions over and over again in order to get your initial public offering out to the public directly? Or is it easy or to do a reverse merger, which means there may be another company out there interested in acquiring your company, and it seems like you are the missing piece in what they may have, and there may be an exchange of stocks by an acquisition that's made. Mergers and acquisition is a very, very big part of the, uh, the financial community. A third way of doing this is to seek out people that have control of what are called, um, I'm trying to think of the name right now, in essence what you have is a, a shell corporation out there, in other words a company for the public, there's a very limited number of shares that are out there, there really isn't any active trading in it, they did all the filing, and it's laying there dormant. If there is any assets in that shell corp, pardon me, in that um, in that shell corporation that's been there sitting and it is public, you may you have an opportunity of buying it, and by buying it, you're able to put together some of the money and save yourself a great deal when it comes down to filing. That's called a reverse merger, and what actually happens is the shell corporation's name is the listed corporation but it's only a matter of time before you're able to change that name into your company's name. And you have now reduced your filing time to be a public company, actually. Uh, once your company is public, then it becomes a scenario of an obligation to the shareholders as a primary factor of the board of directors to increase value or, or maintain value of that company. There are reports that come out, There's you're a public company now, all information must be totally divulged to the general public about your company. Mm -hmm. There can't be any insider stuff going on or, um, or, or closed. It has to be a full disclosure, uh, as opposed to a private company where you can do pretty much almost anything you want, but you still have to file your income tax and everything else, but you can run it the way you want. So, Jack, how is your life today? I, I enjoy my life. It's good. I, I mean, how's anybody's life? We get to breathe, we get to be in the sunshine, and we look at the daily situation. It's a funny thing, retirement. Uh, you really and truly, if you're working in a job kind of thing that you dread doing, yeah, I can understand retirement then. When you're doing something you have a passion for or a love, when you retire, many people seem to fall to the wayside or pass away at that time. If you can keep your doors open and stay on top of the field that you really had the passion for, constantly monitoring it on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis, where you feel a part of it, it can basically stimulate your positive energy continually and you can stay on top of it yourself. Obviously, in the marketplaces today, your daily challenges are keeping up with the way instruments come forward and become new to the marketplace. We see that with derivatives. We see the new regulations that come in. Every year, we can count on new regulations coming in and monitoring of things. We can also see various means of trading. It used to be you would pick up the phone and call your stockbroker to buy shares of stock. It's, so archaic, people don't even remember any of that anymore. Nowadays, there's a few clicks on your phone and you've made your purchase. And you can even pick how you want to make that purchase with different variables in there. When the stock hits a certain point, you want to sell it when, or you want to sell off a portion of it, or you want to buy some more of this thing. 
So there's variations in your own portfolio that take place. So how many hours do you work in a week, let's say? I, I, it's, there's no, to me, there's no regimen. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, the business of the stock market is hinged on world economies, politics, and many other factors, whether they be technical or otherwise. And by keeping your pulse and being aware of the reality of politics and the reality of world conditions, not just listening to the speeches made by politicians, you have a leg up. And then there are financial advisors that you're able to turn on and listen to live. There's streaming videos on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And there's capitalization of this in marketplaces to learn how to, to use this information which we're going to call fundamental information, as well as technical information, which has to do with graphs and charts and numbers and algorithms, etc., to determine whether you want to buy, sell, or do something with a particular stock or a particular marketplace. So how a daily a, a day looks like for you? So what yeah. do you do usually? You go walking your dog oh. on the beach, <laughs> Uh, you take yeah. your car and you go somewhere. I do whatever <laughs> I feel it. like doing. It's really pretty much what I did when I was at work, except I would want to see how the business was working, go in there. My biggest thing is, quite frankly, uh, paying attention to news items. And I don't mean the daily local news, and I don't mean the biased news. I do all the listening to news, whether it happens to be uh, from London or even uh, Alcazar or any of the news areas, if you listen to one, you're going to get a biased view. Jack, thank you very much for being here today and inviting us to your home in Miami. My pleasure. I really enjoy Miami and sharing with you. And please let us know if there is any new business opportunity coming up that you feel like very interested and uh, very passionate about. There's a lot of business opportunities coming out, and especially for entrepreneurs today. The younger, the better. And it seems like the skill sets are there in, in the development of these things. And as far as marketing and sales, that's the area I like to be involved in. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. Bye.